Hello everyone. Today we're going to be talking about the marginal rate of substitution. Okay, so first of all, we've already spoken about Keiko's indifference curves. So Keiko has two um, things that she likes. She likes um, living, and that includes leisure and things that she likes doing, and that is um, along the x-axis of the curve that we're looking at. And then she also likes learning. She likes um, learning for the pleasure of learning itself, but also she likes being successful with her studies. So both of these things are goods. And then what we can do is we can think about the different kinds of um, the different indifference curves that she has here, and we can see that uh, U1A is the lowest indifference curve, U2A is intermediate, and U3A is the highest indifference curve that you can get, um, that she would like to get here. Now, when we're thinking about these different indifference curves, we want to think about comparing the trade-offs that people are willing to make among different consumption bundles. And so that's where the marginal rate of substitution comes in. The reason being, as you can see here, we're going to have three different points, F, I, and G, on three different indifference curves. But what we're also going to see is that if we compare those different points, the slopes of um, Keiko's indifference curves are different at those points. And what that's going to correspond to is the fact that she's actually going to be willing to trade off um, less of um, the Y good for the X good when we move along an indifference curve, or if we compare indifference curves for given Y and varying levels of X. So that's what's happening here when we're comparing points F, I, and G. So how do we think about that? The marginal rate of substitution tells us the maximum amount of Y Keiko would be willing to give up to get a small unit more of X. That's what the marginal rate of substitution means. Um, how much Y she's willing, in terms of what she prefers, to trade off to give up in order to get an additional unit of x. So the marginal rate of substitution is also the least amount of y that Keiko would view as an adequate substitute for losing a small amount of x. So that if she did the substitution, she would be no worse off than before. Now that point about being no worse off than before is because we think about the marginal rate of substitution as telling us something about what goes on along an indifference curve. So we are thinking about being at least as well off as before because she remains on the same indifference curve. And we can think about comparing points F and H um, along an indifference curve. Okay, so let's think about that and also think about um, what we're going to be thinking about when comparing these different points. So the first thing to think about here is that at point F, um, Keiko is going to be willing to give up more of the y good in order to get an additional unit of the x good. Whereas at point h down here, she's going to be willing to give up much less of the y good in order to get an additional unit of the x good. So let's think about why that is. Well, here it is. The marginal rate of substitution, as we've already said, should be read as the units of good y per unit of good x. And so we think about the marginal rate of substitution as being equal to the ratio of the margin utilities of the two goods. So that's the marge utility of good x, so here, living, over the marge utility of y, here, learning. Now, that's true because the amount of y that can compensate Keiko for a small loss of x is the ratio of her marge utility of x, which tells us how much she misses the x that she's given up, to the marge utility of y, which tells us how much she appreciates the compensating gain in y if she's given up some x. So we can both move up and down the um, indifference curve. Now, another way to think about the marginal rate of substitution, as we will see soon, is that is the negative of the slope of the indifference curve. So it's the negative of the slope of the indifference curve. We're going to see exactly how this works in a second, but the main thing that we want to contemplate here is when I'm comparing point F and point H, and I think about that idea of the negative of the slope of the indifference curve, the first thing that we can see is that um, the indifference curves are negatively sloped. So our marginal rate of substitution here for two goods that we like is going to be a positive value. The negative of a negative is a positive. Okay, because we've got the negative of the slope. The slope is negative. Therefore, the marginal rate of substitution here is going to be a positive. Now, when we're looking at this, and, I th and we think about that definition, this idea of the marginal rate of substitution being in the negative of the slope of the indifference curve, if I look at point F, the slope there is very steep. Okay, it's a steep slope there at that point, right? So when we're looking at point F, there's a steep slope there. Now, what that means is that the slope has a large magnitude. Now, the negative of that large magnitude is a large number, right? So F compared to H, what's happening at H? 
H has a shallow slope. It's pretty, pretty flat at H. Now, what that means then is that the slope has a low value at point H. So when I think about those two things, what that tells me is two different things. Firstly, at point F, the marginal rate of substitution is high. At point H, the marginal rate of substitution is low. What that means at each of the points is at F, um, Keiko is willing to give up more learning in order to get an additional unit of living, whereas at H, she's not willing to give up that much learning in order to get an additional unit of living. Now, this is going to, do, to be to do with her marginal, her marginal utilities of X and Y, as we'll see. So let's think about this definition um, that I already mentioned of the marginal rate of substitution being the negative of the slope of the indifference curve. How do we get to that? We've said that it's equal to the ratio of the margin utilities. So where we need to start is we're going to use the total derivative. And we said that the um, total derivative along an indifference curve, we're going to think about the change in utility, du. And what is that going to be equal to? It's going to be equal to the partial derivative of u with respect to x multiplied by the total change in x plus the partial change in u um, with respect to y multiplied by the total change in y. Now here's the trick, right? The trick is, is that along an indifference curve, what happens to utility? Does utility change? No, it doesn't. Because utility doesn't change, that means that this is equal to zero. DU is zero along an indifference curve. Okay, well, knowing that, we can rearrange this. Remember, too, that partial U, partial X, that's the marginal utility of X. And partial U, partial Y, that is the marginal utility of Y. And we denote each of those respectively u sub x and u sub y. So let's write this out again. That's u sub x times dx plus u sub y times dy. Okay, and we know that all of this is equal to zero. So what do we do now? We're just going to rearrange this. So we've got um, u y dy on the one side and we've got u x dx on the other. So that means that we're going to have minus ui dy equal to ux dx. Now what do we do? We're going to divide through by ui. So divide by u subscript y. What is that going to leave us with? Minus dy equal to ux over ui dx. Now what do we need to do? We take dx of both sides. All right, well, you can think about this notion as dividing through by dx, but that's not quite right. We want to say take dx of both sides. So when we do that, we're going to see we're going to get minus dy dx equal to u sub x over u sub y, and that is equal to the marginal rate of substitution in terms of x and y. So here we have it. We have the negative of the slope of the indifference curve, or the marginal rate of substitution, is equal to the ratio of margin utilities, ux over uy. And that's exactly what we have in the math note in the, book, in the book. And you want to think here about the comparison of our understanding of points f and h um, versus what we see here with the math. So let's go back to um, points f and h. What can we see here? At point f, what is true? We have a fair amount of y, and we have not much x. Because of diminishing marginal utility, this means that we have a low marginal utility of y and a high marginal utility of x. What this means then is that our marginal rate of substitution is large. Okay, so the marginal rate of substitution at point f is big. At point h, on the other hand, the marginal utility of x is low, and the marginal utility of y is high. Remember that u sub y is in the denominator and u sub x is in the numerator. Therefore, that's going to be a small number. And so point F, we had a large MRS. Point H, we had a small MRS. And so we can see that too through this idea of the ratio of the margin utilities. We'll come back to this idea later and we'll show what this does with a Cobb-Douglas utility function at a later point.